have internships available. So when you get to that age, think about that too. So the society does everything from you know building this building to interpretive exhibits. We're now in the process of trying to protect eight plus more acres of land that connects the refuge to SCCF land, which is the Santa Bell Captiva Conservation Foundation. It's on the waterways. It's just as you exit the refuge. So if anybody is interested in learning more, it's a $2 million project that kind of fell in our laps that we were not quite prepared for. But we didn't want to lose the opportunity to try and protect that land. So we are doing that, and we do a number of other things. So if you're not a member, there's beautiful sunset brochures as you walk out. We'd love to have you join. I mentioned earlier that we have the E Ding on the Wing newsletter. If you're not receiving that, sign up for that. Make sure your phones are off because Congress, back when Theodore Roosevelt was active, did not have cell phones. So if you don't, if you don't have your volume off or on vibrate, please do so. And um, a special thank you to our lecture series sponsors. Uh, they are Hightower Investments, Hightower Advisors out of Fort Myers. Jack Thomas is one of the lead uh, people there, and he grew up on Sanibel along Woodring Point. So he understands and appreciates the value of what Sanibel is and what the refuge is and they wanted to be a part of this lecture series. And then Mike and Terry Baldwin, who are volunteers, board members, and very active and involved with the Refuge as well, have helped sponsor this lecture series. So a big thank you to our sponsors. I'm now going to introduce, not the president. You, no, that's all right. He's okay. not here today. All right, Joe Wygand <laughs> is not here today, but I'm going to introduce <laughs> Joe Wygand, who is a political science graduate at the University in the, of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee, Served later as a graduate assistant at the Center for Government Studies at Northern Illinois University. He's been named a Wilkins Scholar, a Harry S. Truman Scholar, and a Thomas Watson Fellow. At the pinnacle of a 25-year career in public policy and political campaigns, he began reprising the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. He has performed in all 50 states and was also invited to the White House in 2008 as part of the official anniversary of Teddy Roosevelt's birth to portray him in the East Room. Please join us in welcoming historian, writer, political consultant, and lecturer on the life and times of Theodore Roosevelt, Joe Wygand. I am now introducing President Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> mention this fellow, uh, uh, Joe Wiegand. I understand he's a nice fellow. <laughs> but uh, today, well, you're Congress and I'm the President. April Fools, right? <laughs> uh, when I was a, uh, your United States President serving from, uh, I know this young man Sean probably knows the dates, uh, September of 1901 until March of 1909. Uh, well, I was a progressive, especially on the issues of the conservation of our natural resources, uh, on the regulation of uh, the large business trusts. And I discovered in advancing uh, the cause uh, uh, that the opposite of progress very often was Congress. <laughs> uh, I also, uh, when running for the presidency unsuccessfully in 1912, said that there were so many investigations of corruption and malfeasance in the United States Senate uh, that uh, when roll was called, instead of answering present, uh, uh, the senators normally would shout out, Not guilty! <laughs> uh, but today, uh, I look out and I do have great hope uh, for this Congress. Uh, imagine what you might be able to do if the Constitution did delegate to you the authority to uh, author the laws of the United States. Uh, there's a great difference, of course, in uh, looking out on this Congress uh, than the Congresses that served during my administration. Uh, can you imagine what the greatest difference would be? They wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> they did not wear shorts. Uh, that is a, a big difference. Uh, but of course, uh, I think we have a majority of women in this Congress, and isn't that a bully good thing? Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, what is the phrase that's become popular now? A woman's place is in the House, <laughs> and in the Senate, right. and uh, perhaps right. soon in the White House as well. We'll see. Uh, well, I am delighted to be with you, and uh, in the spirit of uh, being a Congress assembled. Uh, well, you might think that uh, uh, well, a president might be used to addressing Congress. Uh, what is the speech uh, that uh, is made annually by the president? The State of the Union. Uh, we call it, of course, uh, uh, the message to Congress. Uh, 
Now, uh, what do you know about uh, my messages to Congress? Something that uh, might be a little bit different than uh, what we do today. Uh, President Thomas... began the tradition of sending the message uh, uh, as a written document to be read by the clerk of uh, the House or the clerk of the Senate. Now, I continued in this tradition, as did every president uh, between. Uh, it was Woodrow Wilson uh, in 1913 who began to address the Congress in person. So I have the pleasure uh, today of doing what I never did during my presidency, <laughs> addressing Congress. Uh, I gave an annual message to Congress each and every year from 1902 until 1909. And, uh, well, I've got a little bit of news for you. Uh, when the clerk would read my message to Congress, uh, they averaged about four hours. Uh, <laughs> I got down into the weeds, the details of, uh, of uh, 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 the substance of the policies of the country. Uh, so much so, uh, in 1907, uh, uh, do we have any from the volunteer state? I know we've got volunteers. Do we have any Tennesseans amongst us? Oh, one, and a shy one at that. <laughs> well, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee in 1907, uh, we'd been touring down the Mississippi River, uh, the Inland Coastal Waterways Commission. Uh, Gifford Pinchot famously on that trip. It was during that trip that we decided to hold the first Governor's Conference on the Conservation of Natural Resources uh, the following spring at the White House. Uh, famously, we got off of the boat at Memphis, and I took a train tour throughout the state of Tennessee uh, to Nashville. I begged the ladies of the Hermitage Society. I said, I just wanted to have a meal at the general's table, uh, President Jackson's home there. Uh, the ladies uh, acquiesced. Uh, when I finished my luncheon, I turned to the steward and I told the gentleman who had served me, I said, sir, that coffee was good to the last drop. <laughs> uh, the coffee was from the Maxwell House Hotel in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, some years after my demise, uh, Maxwell House began using that phrase and attributing the phrase to me in cartoons in the New Yorker and that sort of thing. Uh, well, uh, uh, in any case, uh, the, f uh, the ladies of the Hermitage Society, when I was having luncheon, they lobbied me for federal funds to put in a new plumbing system in uh, the, the President's home. And uh, in my message to Congress uh, uh, the following uh, year in 1908, I specifically requested uh, a new plumbing for President Jackson's home in Nashville, Tennessee, and Congress supported the appropriation. <laughs> well, we can't get into those details perhaps today in a State of the Union. Uh, what do you think of the State of the Union? Uh, most now, uh, Americans, when they answer the question posed by the pollsters, are we on the right track or the wrong track? About 65% of the American people believe we're on the wrong track. Uh, not necessarily that those 65% would agree upon exactly which track we should be on. Uh, but there's a great deal of uh, unrest amongst the American people. An unrest that uh, we hope may be solved in the election uh, of a new and better Congress. Uh, certainly because of uh, the term limitations placed upon the presidency now, we'll be electing a new president. And I would ask each and every member of this Congress to keep that man or that woman and his or her administration in your nightly prayers. Uh, but not only to, uh, oh, in the words uh, of James 122, uh, the uh, verse upon which I had my hand taking the oath of office in 1905, uh, be thou not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word also, uh, whether a member of Congress or the most important office in the land, that of citizen. I hope that you'll do the things that need to be done. Uh, I was known as uh, uh, the head of the Fellowship of the Doers when I was your president. Uh, oh, there's always some sort of person that has an idea about what the uh, 100th or 200th thing might be to do. I wanted practical men and women about me, uh, those that wanted to discuss what the next thing to do might be and then get about getting that work done. <coughs> uh, I said I didn't know what the American people thought. I only knew what they ought to think. I wasn't into taking polls myself. I was rather confident about what uh, the right thing to do was. But if something needs to be done, the best thing to do is the right thing. The next, next best thing to do is the wrong thing. Uh, the worst thing to do is nothing. And I'm afraid that uh, in uh, seeing your predecessors in Congress, uh, too often recently, uh, uh, we've seen them doing nothing. Uh, now, 
Uh, my remarks, by the way, I should say for those uh, documenting this, uh, these remarks are not sponsored by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, nor the Department of the Interior. <laughs> we don't want to get anyone in trouble now, do we? Uh, now, Ms. Miller uh, and uh, the Society, she mentioned the blue shirts of the volunteers. I know that uh, many of you do indeed volunteer here at Ding Darling. Uh, many of you volunteer uh, back home. You do good deeds on behalf of conservation, education, historic preservation, you do good deeds in your churches, your synagogues, your temples. Of course, this is America. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Certainly no good deed goes without its second guessing, its Monday morning quarterbacking, its criticism. Persist in your good deeds, especially on behalf of conservation. And when you are criticized, take some heart from the words that I shared with the French over a century ago at the Sorbonne. Uh, when Mrs. Roosevelt and I were touring Europe after my presidency and after the great hunting safari I undertook with my son Kermit in Africa on behalf of the Smithsonian, I shared with the French in a speech called Citizenship in a Republic uh, my viewpoints about uh, what it meant to be a citizen. And it meant doing those good deeds, taking on the fight of the day, and uh, spending yourself in a worthy cause. And then when you're criticized, remember what I told the French then and you here today, in Sanibel, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man and today to the woman who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who knows the great devotions, the great enthusiasms, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who in the end, at the best, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, that his name shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Good citizens, we've all known victory, we've all known defeat. We're all human, we all prefer the former over the latter. But I hope that uh, while we might suffer a defeat every now and then, uh, that in the good spirit of this country, uh, when you're knocked down, you'll get back up again and get back into the fight for life. I hope that might be the, the greatest example of my life for the young people today. Uh, well, Congress, what should we enact? What would you have this country do if indeed you served on Capitol Hill? If you served in a, as a member of the House or the member of the Senate? Of course, another great change that's come across the country, part of our progressive movement, uh, we of course advanced ideas like the referendum and the recall, but we also advanced the idea that the members of the United States Senate should no longer be elected by members of the state legislature, but should be elected by the people themselves. Uh, the advancement of the primary system within each party as well, uh, that uh, the voters might be able to nominate and elect the members of Congress rather than seeing that work done uh, in the uh, conventions, in the smoke-filled rooms. Uh, well, I'm a Republican. I know that some of you, uh, I've met with you and your colleagues previously, and you've lobbied me. You've said uh, you wouldn't be a Republican today. Uh, well, I think I'm a rather complicated character. And to know the history of the democracy, that is the Democratic Party, and the history of the Republican Party, uh, well, of course, I bolted the Republican Party in 1912. Uh, much to the consternation of many of my Republican colleagues in Congress, uh, many lost their seat during that uh, election, including my son-in-law, Congressman Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the split uh, in the Republican Party so great uh, that we not only lost the White House, Taft and I splitting the Republican vote, Wilson uh, uh, running as a progressive himself, uh, I think if the democracy had nominated a more conservative Democrat, uh, saying the tradition of uh, uh, Grover Cleveland, uh, he himself a, a gold standard man, uh, well, I think I might have won the race. You know I won six states in 1912? Uh, do we have anyone here from uh, California, from Washington, uh, South Dakota, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania? Well, uh, uh, you're still uh, uh, living in uh, wonderful states and, and showing your wisdom by following the migratory fowl uh, here today. 
But, uh, of course, I bolted the party and, and was thought it's a, a most terrible opponent uh, for the, uh, the damage done to the Republican Party in those congressional elections, uh, the Wilson administration having its origin from that contest. But I wonder if you realize in 1916, I turned down the nomination of the Progressive Party, and uh, that same day, uh, on the day that I announced what was the death knell for the Progressive Party, I endorsed Charles Evans Hughes, uh, the Republican jurist of New York. <laughs> in 1919, uh, spoiler alert, I, I John died January 6, 1919. <laughs> uh, in 1919, at the time of my demise, I was the leading candidate for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Uh, the last bit of writing uh, at my bedside, uh, the draft of a note to the chairman of the Republican National Committee, uh, a man whose election I had supported uh, in a, uh, a very heated contest. Uh, so, uh, now, you're Congress and I'm the president. What should we do? Uh, well, we've got to uh, build upon the laws that are already on the books. Uh, no president and no Congress uh, starts with a, a blank slate. You inherit uh, not only uh, the laws that are on the books, but you inherit uh, the condition of the economy, uh, the, uh, the spirit of the American people, and the uh, international conditions in which we find ourselves. Uh, what do you think I might have thought the greatest law uh, that Congress uh, passed and that I signed uh, during my administration? I wonder if it might give us some counsel for what we might do in the future. Anyone at all? National Park. Yeah. National Park. I, I love the fact that I'm known f uh, in association with the National Parks. Uh, which was our first? Yellowstone. 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 1872. President Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, when I became your president, there were five national parks. I doubled the number of national parks to ten. Maybe you've been to uh, my first, Crater Lake in Oregon. A beautiful site. Uh, William Gladstone Steele, the great Portland businessman, spending 20 or 30 years lobbying Congress for the creation of that park. Uh, Wind Cave in South Dakota. Uh, they're still exploring the furthest reaches of that subterranean cabin. Uh, the uh, Indian ruins in Mesa Verde, Colorado. What a great national treasure. Uh, two of my other national parks have reverted to other uses. Uh, Sully's Hill at Devil's Lake in North Dakota, where I spent some time uh, uh, to the west in the Badlands as a cattle rancher in my youth. It's now a national game preserve, uh, ably administered by the Department of the Interior. And uh, Platt National Park, uh, some of you may have enjoyed the waters at uh, what is now Chickasaw National Recreation Area in Oklahoma. Uh, so I'm given credit for the national parks, but perhaps erroneously so. It took an act of Congress to name a national park, and of course, very often, uh, those senators, those representatives from the states uh, wherein we wanted to create a national park, well, they had the idea that there might be some better, perhaps a more profitable use uh, for the land than uh, simply to make it a national park. The National Park Service, we celebrate this year the centennial of the creation of the National Park Service. Frankly, about the only thing Woodrow Wilson got right. <laughs> but we've got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, now, uh, uh, think again. What think might have been the greatest act of Congress? And I, I'm afraid uh, so much of my legacy is just dust in the streets of history. My most uh, important accomplishment, uh, though it occurred, uh, uh, the uh, ultimate uh, uh, completion of the project, occurred again during the Wilson administration in August of 1914. Panama Canal. Panama Canal. Ha have you seen it? Have you sailed through it? I, I never sailed through it myself. But when I went to Panama in 1905, you realize I was the first president to leave the United States during my term of office. And there were some of my, uh, some of my critics in Congress uh, who uh, said that uh, this was unconstitutional, that I had no constitutional authority to leave the United States during my term of office. I stated, indeed, that uh, since uh, in Panama, I would be in contact with the nation's capital by shipboard to shipboard radio, that there would be no vacancy in the office. <laughs> One of the many times that I came to a constitutional crisis with Congress and saw myself through. So it was indeed in uh, 1903 and 1904, uh, the passage of the Isthmian Canal Act, uh, the uh, recognition and the support by the Senate of our treaty uh, with the newly recognized Republic of Panama, Panama being a province that broke away from Colombia 
with some assistance from the United States Navy. Uh, well, uh, that, I do believe, was the greatest act uh, of the Roosevelt administration. For while the conservation of our natural resources, the preservation of our game and its habitat, uh, the preservation of the wild places uh, in which we can explore is probably what I'm best remembered for by a, a modern Congress, the first responsibility of the federal government is to provide for the sovereignty of the United States, the protection of the American people and its interests, domestic and uh, overseas. Uh, the uh, creation of the Panama Canal cut to one-third the amount of time necessary to move our great naval assets from one ocean to the other. Founded uh, as a, an Atlantic nation along the Atlantic coast, in a century and a quarter, hence our founding, we'd filled in the continent. Uh, we were equally now a Pacific nation, especially with the uh, annexation of Hawaii, uh, the winning of protectorates uh, from the Spanish-American War in the Philippines and Guam, you realize when the uh, Spanish-American War broke out in 1898, the battleship Oregon was stationed in San Francisco. It took that ship 66 days to make it from San Francisco all the way around the Southern Cape and eventually to make the war in Cuba. Uh, the newspaper reports uh, were full of speculation uh, when we were unable to communicate with the battleship as to whether or not it engaged some Spanish ships or was sunk in a storm in the Straits of Magellan along the way. Uh, now. That saves a great deal of fuel, doesn't it? Uh, uh, economists have looked at the issue of uh, the amount of uh, uh, diesel oil and that sort of thing that is saved, uh, that the ships no longer have to make the, uh, the long journey. Uh, the time and uh, resources that are saved, because of course uh, there was a great deal of shipping that would unload at one coast or the other and send the goods across the, uh, uh, the Isthmian Railroad uh, that ran across Panama. Uh, imagine the delays in, in shipping, the costs associated there. But you might also realize, and this gets back to the fact that uh, these issues and the characters uh, involved are complicated, you might realize that the building of the Panama Canal was probably the greatest act of environmental degradation in the early portions of the 20th century. Uh, I'm not easily encapsulated, I think, in this modern idea of being a liberal or being a conservative. Uh, there are many issues on which I strongly agree with uh, the members of the democracy and many issues on which I strongly agree with uh, members of the Republican Party. Uh, so I would just ask that uh, as we proceed in the considerations of this Congress, uh, realize that uh, you're might li more likely to find me in the middle on most issues, uh, and uh, perhaps on the right or on the left on other issues. Uh, but uh, I would not be a member of the democracy. I'm not quite sure what's going to come out of the Republican Convention in Cleveland, uh, but I expect to uh, endorse the nominee. Unless it's that man Trump. <laughs> ha have you seen the uh, Have you seen the movie Citizen Kane? Yes. Yes. And of course, uh, and if the youngsters haven't, I recommend it greatly. Uh, of course, an American classic. Uh, uh, the uh, Orson Welles playing Citizen Kane in that movie. You know, he's really portraying William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper publisher who inherited his father's gold mining fortune. Uh, he, of course, uh, ran for the presidency in 1904, and uh, he was a buffoon. Well, draw your own analogies uh, consideration of the election today. Again, again, nothing here is sponsored by the Department of the Interior. Uh, domestically, of course, uh, uh, there were many acts uh, passed by Congress during my administration, some of them rather remote. Uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act? Uh, I wonder if any of you have read the book, The Jungle? I think uh, any of us who have read it, it it puts one off meat products for a week or two, doesn't it? It's, it, it perhaps created more vegetarians than any uh, uh, vegetarian advocacy organization. Uh, can you imagine when The Jungle uh, uh, was published uh, as a serial in a magazine uh, that within months of the publication of that book, Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, in part for the fact that I read the book as well and was put off my meat. And uh, I sent inspectors to follow up in the meatpacking plants of Chicago. How about the Hepburn Act? <coughs> it has nothing to do with a beautiful actress in the movies. <laughs> uh, the Hepburn Act uh, uh, gave the uh, United States, uh, through its Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, the ability to regulate the rates charged by the railroads uh, for the farmers uh, and uh, made illegal some of the rebates that were being paid to some of the big trusts like Mr. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. Uh, how about uh, the Forest Reserve Act? Not passed during my administration, but perhaps an illustration of the fact that you as members of Congress are going to have to inherit 
the acts of previous Congresses and perhaps improve upon them. The Forest Reserve Act of uh, 1891, signed into law by President Benjamin Harrison. Uh, President Benjamin Harrison, uh, a few short years before, had appointed me to my first federal office. I was a member of the United States Civil Service Commission. Uh, seeing that uh, civil servants, rather than being hired by the old system of uh, to the victor goes the spoils, imagine with every new presidential administration, good civil servants being turned out of office simply because they had an R or a D after their name. Instead of uh, being hired or promoted, based upon uh, the quality of service, the ability to uh, 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 show one's talent and skills through examination. Well, as a civil service commissioner, I fought against corruption in President Harrison's own Republican administration, uh, doing such a good job uh, that President Cleveland, his Democratic successor, reappointed me. And then I fought corruption in the Democratic regime just as well. Uh, but the uh, Forest Reserve Act of 1891, it uh, is perhaps one of the most important uh, conservation acts in our, in our history. Uh, President Harrison should be well remembered for the act. Uh, it allowed uh, for the United States government to withdraw uh, from the public lands and to preserve uh, certain uh, forested areas. Uh, now, of course, we had a great deal of public land, uh, most of it originating from the Louisiana Purchase uh, during Jefferson's administration. And as for those of you that might be Jeffersonian, Democratic, Republicans, of course, he had a limited view of the federal government with regards to uh, the strictures of the Constitution. But you realize that when uh, uh, President Jefferson uh, uh, was able to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase, he had no constitutional authority whatsoever uh, to arrange for that purchase. But of course, uh, one of the most important inheritance we have, the, the great western states uh, with which I am closely associated. Uh, now, uh, uh, President Harrison, uh, if I have my uh, uh, notes in memory, I do believe that President Harrison uh, added some 7 million acres of national forests uh, to uh, our reserves. Uh, his uh, successor, President Cleveland, uh, about uh, 13 million acres uh, added to the national forests. And, and President Cleveland, well, about uh, 25 million. Uh, don't hold me to the figures, but they're approximate. There were 45 million acres of national forests when I became your president. I added 150 million more acres of national forests. <laughs> and I would ask you, I would challenge you, members of Congress, to make sure that uh, we advance the cause of the preservation of our natural resources. But of course, I wasn't like John Muir, a, uh, a preservationist in the way of preserving the wild places and making them a place where people could not go. Like Gifford Pinchot, our great national forester, I believed that the conservation of our natural resources <coughs> meant also their wise use and stewardship for the greatest number of people in the long run. Uh, so I'm afraid that uh, with regards to uh, issues like damming the Hetch Hetchy <coughs> River, uh, something that was a great lament to John Muir, well, it provided water and electricity to the people of San Francisco, uh, lately devastated by the terrible earthquake there. Uh, when it was a balance of what was best for the people or what was best uh, uh, for some of the woodland creatures or the great uh, places of uh, uh, majestic beauty. You've got to consider what's best for the people in the long run. And that's where we've got some of the uh, controversies uh, with regards to uh, uh, the generation of power by wind and solar rather than by coal or nuclear. <coughs> but uh, I'm sure here at Ding Darling, looking about, uh, there's many a bird lover here. Uh, so many of you, I imagine, love to, uh, uh, to see the bird life here in Florida. Uh, you realize that the, uh, the wind turbines uh, kill millions of birds every year. Uh, nothing comes without its cost. And that's got to be uh, uh, thought in the consideration of this Congress and your successors as well. Uh, now, I, uh, in 1905, was able to get uh, the Transfer Act passed. Uh, probably the, the, the greatest change in the Forest Service uh, between its origin and my administration. In 1905, we transferred the Bureau of Forestry from uh, being a small bureau in the, in the uh, Department of the Interior, we transferred it to the Department of Agriculture, uh, where Gifford Pinchot, our national forester, uh, our first uh, formally trained national forester, uh, began to uh, uh, implement scientific methodologies with regards to the harvesting of those uh, lumber products. 
uh, we established for the first time that the great lumber interests actually had to pay royalties uh, on the uh, lumber that they harvested from the national forests, uh, much to the grousing and chagrin of those lumber interests. In 1907, a, a United States Senator from, from Oregon, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, uh, he, he passed an amendment uh, on the Omnibus Appropriations Bill for the Agriculture Department, lamenting that I'd uh, put so many millions of acres uh, into reserve. That amendment stripped from me and all future presidents the authority by executive order to name any more national forests in the great forested states of the Northwest. I had to sign that bill. Otherwise, we would have had one of these uh, government shutdowns, right? Uh, well, uh, there's no uh, new problem, just a, a rehashed problem. I, I had to sign that bill. But each and every night before the deadline for that bill came, Pinchot came to the White House. We burned the midnight oil. Uh, we studied the Western surveys. And the night before I had to sign that greater bill, I signed into existence 16 million more acres of national forest in those South Saint states. They are still known as the great midnight forests. <laughs> uh, this Congress should know that if you introduce a bill, your bill might not get heard by a committee. Indeed, a committee is uh, very often a graveyard for good legislation. Uh, but uh, you might advance the cause. You might be able to hold a hearing. The work that you do might actually uh, be passed by a future Congress. Uh, so I uh, encourage you to have initiative. Uh, each and every year when I was your president, we tried to advance legislation that would allow the federal government to purchase private lands for the creation of national forests. For, of course, the federal government owned very little in the way of lands east of the Mississippi River. Uh, all of those lands were either private or held by state or local governments. But uh, the Weeks Act, uh, uh, sponsored by Congressman John Weeks of uh, Weston, Massachusetts, uh, Congressman Weeks finally, in 1911, was able to pass the act that bears his name that uh, allowed the federal government to use funds to purchase private lands in the eastern portion of the country. So if you come from the eastern states and have national forests about you, there are some wonderful national forests. Uh, amongst the earliest, uh, the Vanderbilts uh, sold to the federal government the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. Uh, there are wonderful forests named for some of my heroes, uh, Daniel Boone uh, in Kentucky, George Washington National Forest in his native Virginia. Well, of course, uh, you might wonder again, and, and I imagine there's a, a constitutionalist or two uh, here. You've, you've sworn to uphold the Constitution. Uh, there were some that would say there's no federal authority uh, to, uh, to purchase these private lands. Uh, but we had authority uh, through navigable rivers. Uh, the, uh, the concept that the United States government had authority over navigable rivers. So the act was written in such a way that we were able to purchase lands that were contiguous to these navigable rivers. And imagine uh, the clear cutting that was very often done by the lumber industry then. Of course, when the rains would come, those clear cut lands would wind up in those navigable rivers no longer being navigable, uh, being uh, polluted by the runoff uh, from what had been done by the lumber industry. And of course, many of those rivers as well being polluted by the industries along the river as well. The Weeks Act probably did more to keep the rivers of the eastern United States clean than any other action, including the, the, the Clean Air and Water Act of later administrations. Uh, give credit to Congressman Weeks, uh, your previous colleague. Uh, we walk in the paths of those that have come before us. Uh, in 1903, I perhaps acted a bit extra constitutionally myself. And it's not unrelated to this wonderful wildlife refuge here. My friend, Frank Chapman, uh, uh, the head ornithologist at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, the museum, the, the charter for which was signed uh, in my family uh, living room. My father, one of the original members of the board of directors of that great museum contiguous to uh, Central Park in New York City. Uh, well, Frank Chapman, the head ornithologist, a friend of mine, he and members of the Florida Audubon Society deluged me with letters at the White House complaining that for another year millions of nesting birds would be slaughtered and their nestlings left to starve. All that women might wear the feathers of dead birds on their hats and on their dresses, sometimes wearing entire dead birds as decorations. There's really no explaining fashion. Well, I uh, asked my Attorney General, Philander Knox, was there anything in the laws of the Constitution of the United States which would prohibit me from naming Pelican Island, a small island here in Florida off the coast of Sebastian, uh, Indian River County now, north of Vero Beach, 
a federally owned island. Uh, of course, Florida coming to the United States is federal property first. Well, I asked if there was anything that would prohibit me from naming that island the last nesting place of the brown pelican along the Atlantic as a federal bird sanctuary. My attorney general hemmed and hawed and said there's no express prohibition. I said I thus declare it. The first of 51 bird sanctuaries declared during my administration. The bird sanctuaries became known eventually as our national wildlife refuges. Boy, boy. In earnestness, during the time uh, that we were creating the first bird sanctuaries, we had no authority from Congress, the power of the purse, appropriations, uh, and taxes originating in the House of Representatives, we had no authority whatsoever to pay the game wardens that would protect these reserves. The game wardens were often hired by the Audubon societies. The first game warden at Pelican Island, a man named Paul Cragle, uh, remembered there uh, with a wonderful monument and statue uh, in Sebastian. I do recommend that if your travels take you uh, along the Atlantic coast that you visit Sebastian and Pelican Island, uh, there's a wonderful centennial boardwalk that takes you through the history of the creation of what are now over 400 national wildlife refuges uh, throughout the country. Paul Cragle was paid by the Audubon Society one dollar a month to protect the birds on Pelican Island. Uh, almost enough money to pay for the shotgun shells and the gasoline uh, to run his motorboat uh, across the, the waterway. Uh, but it was dangerous duty. Uh, during my administration, Three Audubon game wardens gave the ultimate sacrifice in those feather wars. Here in Florida, Guy Bradley and, uh, and uh, Columbus McLeod. In South Carolina, uh, Presley Reeves. Men who were murdered by these uh, greedy, gluttonous plume hunters. You realize that in those days, the feathers of a snowy white egret were worth more per ounce than an ounce of gold. Terrible things come out in a man's character if he's of the wrong sort. And this uh, on the issue of education. It's a wonderful thing that we have such a, a great uh, and expensive uh, system of education in the country. I myself was homeschooled uh, uh, before going to Harvard. And I assure you, I didn't learn much of practical value at Harvard. <laughs> Most of my classmates majored in the issue of nightlife across the Charles River in Boston. <laughs> but uh, it's a wonderful thing if a person has a, a good education. I uh, spoke about the quality of the education, though. What's actually taught? Uh, for uh, I was told uh, by one man that my views on education were a bit out of the ordinary. He, he said, uh, don't you realize that without an education, a man might steal from a railroad? I said, sir, you're right. And history has proved with the wrong sort of education, a man might steal the entire railroad. <laughs> <laughs> so with regards to uh, uh, what we're going to do in the future. Uh, we've got uh, many challenges. And again, I hope we might build upon the work that's been done by Congress and that we might uh, continue to make progress as a people. But we cannot rely ourselves simply upon the elected class, the members of Congress, uh, the presidency. You hold uh, as well uh, in your dual capacity as members of Congress today and citizens, you hold the highest position <coughs> as citizen. And I hope you exercise those rights, not only in voting, once every uh, two years or four years, but in each and every day holding your elected uh, uh, public servants to be accountable uh, to the Constitution that they've sworn to uphold, and more importantly perhaps uh, to uh, the needs and the decency of uh, the people uh, that send them to do that duty. So, uh, now if you find me preaching, you're right. But one senator came to the White House, he said, Mr. President, you're preaching. I said, Senator, you're right. <laughs> and the presidency is a bully pulpit, too. Uh, one of the many phrases I've left in the American political lexicon. Uh, careful, that's encouragement to a politician to keep talking. <laughs> I was the first president to make permanent office space available at the White House for members of the press. Something I'm sure many of my successors deeply regret. <laughs> I would be r remiss in the spirit of a congressional hearing if I didn't uh, at least take a, a question or two from any of you here. I, I wonder if there's any question that you might have on your mind. The nice lady from Tennessee, what is your name, please? Marilyn. Marilyn, what is your family name? Aldridge. Aldridge. Ms. Aldridge, the floor is yours. What do you think about the conflict between law enforcement and the uh, ranchers? 
What do I think about the conflict between uh, law enforcement uh, and the ranchers? We're a nation of laws. Uh, if you do not uh, 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 find yourself on the right side of the law, if you disagree with a particular law, if you feel that the law or the enforcement of those laws uh, is somehow injuring your private interests, well, then you've got uh, uh, the access to the courthouse. Uh, you take the case uh, through administrative appeal, and then if not happy with the administrative result, you take your, court, uh, your, your case to the courts. I believe that with regards to the ranchers that took the detestable act of occupying with arms Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, one of my 51 National Wildlife Refuges, I'm afraid that they acted uh, with disregard to the law. And I cannot support any citizen who would take the law into his or her own hands in that regard. Putting at great risk uh, those public servants who were present uh, during that time, putting at risk uh, members of the public uh, who uh, might have gone to see uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, activities there. I'm uh, very sorry uh, for the individual uh, who, uh, I think in a way, was responsible for his own killing uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the solution of that particular uh, situation in Oregon. And I hope that we might learn uh, that uh, if you're not uh, satisfied with uh, what the government is doing, get involved. Seek your own redress through administrative and judicial appeal. And if you don't like what's going on in the government, well then go about changing the government. But never under force of arms. Uh, never by breaking the laws duly passed uh, by our governments. That's my own viewpoint, madam. And, sir, please, what is your name, please? Paul. Oh, thank you, madam. Paul. Paul, what's your family name, Paul? Zucker. Zucker, Mr. Zucker, where are you from? New York City and Florida. Delightful. Where's your neighborhood in the city? Uh, Upper East Side. Upper East Side. Gramercy Park, myself. <laughs> 28 East 20th Street. You know it well, I well, good to see a fellow New Yorker. Thank and you. now we're, we're again off the record, but for uh, purposes of the Internal Revenue Service, are you living here six months and a day? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> Mr. Zucker, the floor is yours. Okay, I, I wonder how you personally reconcile your, uh, your concern for, for wildlife and, uh, here in the United States and granting land for it and your, the number of trophies that you have hanging on your wall. Along surely, the, uh, surely. Okay. And by trophies, he's not meaning that I got a, a participation award for softball, right? <laughs> I'm a hunter. And sir, Mr. Zucker, hunting done properly is conservation. The big game of this continent, the big game in South America, the big game of Africa, would not be alive today if it were not for hunters who do the work of conserving our great game and its habitat. Uh, when I was a rancher out in the... Here, here, well done. And I think she's packing. Well... <laughs> but when I was a cattle rancher in the Dakota Territory, I'd seen that much of the game had been decimated, not only in the West, but throughout my travels between our native New York and the Western states. I went uh, hunting as a young man uh, uh, before my wedding in 1880. My brother uh, 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 Elliot and I went out hunting in, in Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and just crossed the Red River uh, over into Dakota Territory. And we hardly had any game to hunt at all. Uh, the farmers and ranchers that had preceded us had uh, decimated. Even the deer population was quite low at the time. I thought the bison would become extinct. I thought the Rocky Mountain elk were head for extinction. And so I helped to found Boone and Crockett uh, with uh, 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 so many men like uh, Gifford Pinchot and with uh, 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 George Bird Grinnell who published uh, uh, Forest and Stream, uh, now Field and Stream. And the preservation of the game was on our mind. Uh, Mr. Zucker, I, I might apologize for some of the trophy hunting I might have done in my youth, including my first trip to the Dakota Territory in 1883. I went to go hunt a bison bull, the bison bison, the great buffalo, uh, knowing indeed that the uh, animal was probably on the road to extinction, uh, the policy of the federal government being to eliminate this food source uh, for the Native Americans, or forcing those Native Americans to get their food on the reservation. There's a great deal of injustice in our history, surely. And I must admit, in my bloodlust of my youth, I wanted that bison bull. I spent two weeks uh, along the Little Missouri River, and finally along Cannonball Creek. I shot my bison bull. I, I was so excited I did what I thought was an Indian war dance around its carcass, and tipped Joe Ferris, my hunting guide, $100 for his trouble in accompanying this tenderfoot uh, through the Badlands. 
Uh, now, I paid my penance, Mr. Zucker. You may know that I helped to found the North American Bison Society, headquartered uh, by uh, the New York Zoological Society at the Bronx Zoo. Uh, Professor William Hornaday, uh, one of the uh, founders of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 of the Boy Scouts, uh, he for whom the uh, great gold and silver medals of the uh, Boy Scouts of America, uh, the gold and silver medals for uh, uh, conservation of natural resources. Uh, well, uh, he was the head of the New York Zoological Society. We decided to save the bison from extinction. And so we uh, took bison, some cows and bulls from Yellowstone, some from a private herd in North Texas, and we shipped them to the Bronx Zoo. There, Professor Hornaday experimented with the species grew different sorts of grasses to try to find what was the optimal feed for the bison. And uh, indeed, uh, where he grew those grasses, uh, that is now the Bronx Botanical Garden, across the road from the zoo. We were successful. Train cars of young bison calf were shipped back out to Yellowstone. And of course, if you tour, tour there today, if you listen very closely, you can hear that those bison speak with a distinct Bronx accent. <laughs> But I do uh, uh, share with you, uh, I, I wasn't a, a, a hunter simply for a record number or for some uh, a, a decent trophy is a fine thing. You realize, though, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, some of their biologists recently came out with a report. Uh, it was with regards to uh, our endangered plant species. Where we are losing the most endangered plant species are in public lands where hunting is prohibited. The herbivores, the deer population and others, are, are not being uh, managed properly. They're eating many of the rare plant species that are to be found within those wild areas. So again, it's moderation. Uh, of course, uh, everyone here, those of you that study the issue of funding our uh, uh, wildlife, you understand that the hunting fees, the taxes paid on, on guns and ammunition, uh, provide perhaps, other than general uh, fund uh, 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 allocations, the greatest source of uh, revenue uh, for the preservation of our game. And when I hunted in Africa, I know a great deal is made of the over 2,200 large and small mammalian specimens uh, that Kermit and I collected there. And of course, they make a great record at the Smithsonian Institution, at the American Museum of Natural History. I did say that eventually, in these scientific efforts, I thought that the camera would replace the rifle. Uh, now, that's a thing on which John Muir and I agreed. <laughs> Questions right here, sir. What is your name, please? Kai Carstensen, uh, New Jersey, now Florida. Wonderful. Uh, where in the Garden State was your home, sir? New Brunswick. Delightful. You may know that the, uh, uh, the Palisades uh, uh, Park uh, along the Hudson River uh, was uh, the first uh, bi-state uh, uh, park uh, between New York and New Jersey, uh, adopted during my gubernatorial administration there. I was there before it disappeared. Oh, it has uh, to a great deal, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, Sir? What do you think of Governor Scott and the Florida legislature that they're not purchasing the property in the Everglades that the bond issue uh, directed? Uh, what do I think of uh, Governor Scott? Uh, and uh, now, I, th you brought me up to date on this issue. Of course, there was a great press conference uh, by the governor about what wonderful work was being done with regards to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the transfer of some of the old sugarcane uh, properties, uh, uh, some of the old uh, uh, farming properties, uh, to trust of the uh, public peoples to help uh, reinvigorate the Everglades. I wasn't uh, up to date on the fact that uh, are they not following through on their commitment to purchase the bonds? No. No. Not purchasing the land. Not purchasing They're the using land. using it for other purposes. What would Teddy have done? Uh, I would have uh, kept my promise. If I'd made a promise to the people uh, that those monies would be used for the purchase of those lands, you've got to do that sort of thing. So I don't understand if, if there's some sort of a economic or fiscal crisis in the state government uh, behind which the governor might be uh, uh, justifying his actions. Well, he doesn't think global warming exists, so I guess he doesn't think the uh, water pollution is a problem either. Well, I, I wonder, for many of you, if you've come from the north, we've had some interesting winters, uh, uh, but uh, of course we've got a very warm one this year, and the latest reports of uh, the uh, ice melt uh, uh -huh. along our polar region. Uh, well, we do have... a. Uh, not only uh, global warming, but climate change, right? Uh, but we've got to be realistic about exactly what we can do uh, with regards to changing the climate. Uh, uh, you've got a, every now and then a thing like a volcanic eruption, uh, uh, things like the solar flares uh, that also have their impact as well. We've got to be very careful about the science that we do, but we've got to embrace the science when it's conclusive. Uh, I would uh, castigate Governor Scott if he's 
breaking his promise to the people of Florida, and the people of his country, I would find him on my, on my list of people that I would be criticizing myself. <laughs> Questions here? Ms. Miller, I'm going to defer to the lady in charge of the I program. I was just curious if you were involved in the duck stamp, the federal duck stamp. Well done. Uh, Ding Darling, uh, the originator of the federal duck stamp, was a friend of mine. We met on the campaign trail in 1900 while I was the candidate for the vice presidency, and he, a uh, cartoonist uh, uh, working out of uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, of course, he eventually a Pulitzer Prize winner. But uh, uh, while the uh, preservation of our waterfowl were uh, very much on my mind, of course, the duck stamp came about during my cousin Franklin's administration, uh, when Ding Darling uh, agreed to be the head of the United States Biological Survey. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, did want to save as many of the birds as we could, uh, but we also wanted to encourage uh, responsible hunting uh, of proper fowl. Uh, many were the times when I enjoyed uh, a bit of duck hunting, or, uh, for example, uh, my only wild turkey in the hills uh, of Abermile County, Virginia. I do like the hunting sports, and, and again, this is one place Ding Darling himself enjoyed the bird hunter greatly, uh, always with his shotgun out when he's doing his work. Uh, but uh, a supporter, but no credit myself, Ms. Miller. <coughs> Questions, comments here? Madam, please. What's your name, please? Nancy, where, what's your last name? Stewart. Stewart, uh, and where are you from, Ms. Stewart? I'm from Sinovel now. Oh, I'm in New York. Delightful. Uh, upstate? Upstate New York. Where about? Syracuse. Syracuse. Uh, where at, your sta at our state fair, uh, as your uh, governor, I first used the phrase, the square deal. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to see a daughter of Syracuse here. <laughs> I am curious. I read with interest the River of Doubt. We did a paper on it for our book club. Oh, delightful. Wondered how you maintained that incredible strength that you had to get through that time, and now you've maintained that in your son's lives as well. Uh, well I, I, have you read *The River of Doubt* by Candace Millard? Oh, I hope they've got some in the bookstore. Grab one on the way out. <laughs> but after my presidency, uh, they, during my time, there was no presidential pension. Uh, I was but a man of uh, 51 years of age when I left the White House. I was younger when I left the White House than all but two of my predecessors had been when they entered the White House. I had a large family to provide for, uh, six children, most of them still uh, rather young when I left the White House. Uh, so I decided that in order to provide for my family, I would continue to write books. I wrote 30 books during my lifetime. I did not write well, I simply took well to writing. <laughs> I wrote magazine articles after my presidency, uh, famously for Mr. Abbott's uh, Outlook magazine. And I made speeches in exchange for remuneration. I never made Clinton money, though. Uh, <laughs> the honorariums were modest in those days. But I accepted in 1913 uh, an invitation by South American governments uh, to tour the continent and make speeches uh, professionally. Uh, before I left New York, uh, the Brazilian government augmented the invitation, asking if I would uh, uh, go on an expedition uh, with Colonel Rondon of the Brazilian army. Uh, two years prior, this great uh, army leader with progressive thoughts, he whose rule uh, in engaging the natives of the Amazon jungle was first to do no harm, uh, well, he, uh, he had two years prior been in charge of the troops that strung the first telegraph across the great Amazon jungle. And in doing so, on um, route, he discovered the headwaters of a mighty river that appeared on no map uh, of Brazil, provided by the Brazilian army. Uh, so he, in Portuguese, uh, named the river the Rio de Vida, or the River of Doubt, not knowing where the river went. Uh, I was invited to map this river, uh, to take a, uh, an adventure down river with Colonel Hondo, uh, with his uh, Brazilian army troops, and with my son Kermit along, uh, much to the uh, uh, relief of Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, Kermit had been my companion hunting in Africa. When we, uh, when we uh, uh, got uh, busy on our expedition, uh, we thought that we might hunt for game in the jungle, as we'd done on the safari in Africa. But the jungle was so dense, and the only game being monkeys and snakes that made themselves quite scarce a yard or two into the density of the jungle, uh, well, we uh, nearly starved on that adventure. Uh, we had rations, but very often the rations were lost in the river as our uh, uh, canoes overturned or busted up on the rocks. We had to portage these heavy dugout canoes that we manufactured out of the jungle. Every other mile or two we had to portage these, these heavy canoes. Two Brazilian troopers drowned. Another Brazilian trooper, mad with fever and starving, he being caught for the second time stealing rations, he shot one of his officers to death. 
and after the murder ran off into the jungle, surely to his own demise, for we were surrounded by uh, tribes that still practiced cannibalism, and hunted their human quarry with poison darts. I dashed my leg to the bone trying to save some canoes from being busted up on the rocks, and I developed a malarial fever. Uh, now, I always took with me on every hunting adventure and safari I undertook enough morphine to take my own life. In case of a terrible gun accident or a bear mauling, I did not want to be a fatal burden to my party, and that trip down the river of doubt was the closest I came to taking the poison. I had a 105 degree temperature for two days. I lay in the bottom of a canoe while the entire safari lay still, much to its own peril. Our only chance for survival and salvation to go downstream and hope to find civilization. I recited in my fever over and over again a favorite line from Coleridge. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. After two days of that, I would have shot me. But my son Kermit said, Father, I'm going to take you out of this jungle alive or dead. And it will be marginally easier to do so if you remain alive. <laughs> With those words, Kermit saved my life. And, and uh, when we completed uh, the mapping of the river, I came to uh, Washington, D.C., showed the results of my mapping at uh, the National Geographic Society headquarters. And the Brazilian government renamed the River of Doubt the Rio Roosevelt. Uh, the locals call it the Rio Teodoro today. Uh, Miss Stewart, I I've got to uh, make a mention of your name. We might be kin. I'm a Roosevelt, a Knickerbocker, associated with New York City, the only president born in New York City, New York. But I stand before you half Southerner, half Georgian. My mother's family, the Bullocks, were from Roswell, Georgia. Uh, my parents married in Roswell, nearby Atlanta, in 1853, at the Bullock Hall, a uh, wonderful building that was spared from the torch during the Civil War. For when the Union officer came to serve the millworks, uh, to uh, seize the millworks nearby, the eaves and the chimneys of the old houses of, of uh, Roswell were stenciled with Masonic symbols, the symbols of Freemasonry. Uh, I was a Freemason, so was that Union officer before my birth, and, and uh, when he saw those Freemason symbols, he made sure that his troops burned none of the nice old houses uh, there in Roswell. Now, my grandmother was Martha Stewart. <laughs> she, the daughter of uh, the uh, revolutionary and uh, 1812 general, Daniel Stewart. Uh, Daniel Stewart marched off to Florida here to fight in the Seminole Wars with six sons, all six feet tall and taller, leaving young Martha behind. Now, uh, in their youth, my grandfather and my grandmother were sweethearts. Uh, my grandfather, James Bullock, he proposed marriage to Martha Stewart. And the custom of the day was that a lady refu refused the first proposal. Uh, when General Daniel Stewart marched off to Florida, he wanted to make sure that Martha Stewart was well cared for. So he had one of his elderly friends. Uh, and this was uh, 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 Senator Elliott. Uh, Senator Elliott, who would go on to uh, serve in the Senate from South Carolina, being a Charleston man. He married Martha Stewart, who became Martha Stewart Elliott. Uh, now, my grandfather, within a week of that wedding, my grandfather married uh, General uh, 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 Senator Elliott's daughter, Hester Elliott. Uh, now, when the senator came back from one six-year term, during which my grandmother served as a wonderful hostess in Washington, D.C., well, Senator Elliott died. Hester Elliott, his daughter, died. My grandfather, at that point, married my grandmother, <laughs> at which point he was marrying his stepmother-in-law. <laughs> if that doesn't make me a southerner, I don't know what <laughs> well, I, well, I, I see we've got more questions, but I think I'm getting the sheep's hook uh, from Miss Miller. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here throughout the day until we repeat a program which won't look anything like this one at 1 o'clock. I'm delighted that you're here. Will you join me in three cheers for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and our National Wildlife Refuge? Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Go forth and make good luck.